Our opening scripture comes from Proverbs chapter 2, beginning at verse 1. My son, if you receive my words and treasure my commands within you, so that you incline your ear to wisdom and apply your heart to understanding. Yes, if you cry out for discernment and lift up your voice for understanding, if you seek her as silver and search for her as hidden treasures, then you will understand the fear of the Lord and find the knowledge of God. For the Lord gives wisdom, from his mouth come knowledge and understanding. He stores up sound wisdom for the upright. He is a shield to those who walk uprightly. He guards the paths of justice and preserves the way of his saints. Then you will understand righteousness and justice, equity and every good path. When wisdom enters your heart and knowledge is pleasant to your soul, discretion will preserve you, understanding will keep you. Let us pray. Father God, as we gather this morning, we thank you for your word. We thank you for the message that we received from your word. And we thank you for the opportunity to gather in your house to hear your word spoken today. As we gather, we thank you for each one who's here. As we hear the pastor's message today, give him wisdom and guidance to deliver the message that you have for us and open our ears and our hearts that we might receive that message and take it with us today. Thank you, Lord, for this time. Bless it and bless us, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. And we'll begin our worship with hymn number 250. I know who holds tomorrow, number 250. Let us stand and sing from your heart. Oh, 
Good morning and welcome into the Lord's house today and welcome to those watching on Facebook. It is good to be together and to worship together, to share in God's word today. We do ask his blessing upon our time. We want to take just a moment if you're visiting with us, so would you raise your hand? Do we have any visitors? I don't believe, but it is good to be in the Lord's house. And again, we appreciate those who are watching on Facebook as well as those who are here. Uh, our numbers seem to be growing a little bit each week. And we're thankful for that, but we're thankful for those who are not comfortable being out yet. And uh, we're thankful that you follow us on Facebook and pray that you'll receive a blessing from this worship time. Uh, just a couple of things I wanna mention as far as announcements. First of all, for those who are watching on Facebook, if you have prayer requests or anything else that you want shared during the worship service with the pastor, uh, just click on the comments button or go down the comments line and enter that as a comment, and then we have someone who will monitor that and will share that with the pastor. So just go ahead, if you have a prayer request uh, or something you wanna share, go ahead and enter that right now so that when we come to our prayer time, uh, the pastor will have it. Uh, I do wanna remind you of the Bible studies that uh, Pastor Scott will be beginning, the uh, starting back up, I should say, the Bible study on Wednesday morning at Town & Country this Wednesday at 9.30 a.m. So those who have been uh, attending uh, that or others who have an interest in coming out and joining that, that will be at Town & Country Restaurant in Broadway, Wednesday morning at 9.30. Uh, he is continuing the live stream Bible study on Wednesday evening at seven. Uh, we encourage you to uh, just get on Facebook and, and hook in. It's been a very good study and I think you will get a blessing from it. Uh, if you uh, if you join in that. Uh, for board members, we wanna let you know that we have a board meeting scheduled on the 28th of June. That's two weeks from today. Uh, we'll do it as we customarily do on Sunday evening at 6 p.m. So uh, if you would uh, make note of that, all board members. Uh, again, June 28th, 6 p.m. Uh, notice the, uh, the two addresses there, uh, Vivian Miller, and Rule Tusing will both be turning 99 years young, as it says, uh, this month. And uh, we'd like to uh, uh, make them feel uh, the, 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 the warmth and the love of the church if you would drop them a card and let them know that you're thinking about them on their birthday. Uh, you know, it's a time when so many of us are, are isolated. We can't get out, we can't have guests come in, but uh, we can share together. Yes. Francis Falling will be turning 100 on the 19th. So remember Francis as well. Praise the Lord. I, I knew she was, I didn't realize her birthday was this, this month, but uh, it's fantastic. Is that what you were sharing, Carla? Alrighty. Uh, so we do want to, uh, to remember Francis as well. I uh, do notice the note about the St. Jude yard sale and cruise in uh, that is now scheduled for September 26th. And uh, Lord willing, we hope that uh, things will be eased up and we'll be able to do that. And uh, so we look forward to that. But put that down uh, and plan on that for September the 26th. This is our annual fundraiser to help support St. Jude's uh, hospitals for children. And then notice the note on the back of your bulletin, the McDaniel twins will be one year old on the 11th of July. And it's a big birthday party uh, planned for, uh, for that evening or that afternoon at noon. Uh, Esther needs to have your uh, RSVP, if you will, or to let her know by June 16th, if you're planning to attend so that she knows how to plan and be prepared for that. 
So again, uh, the party will be on July the 11th and uh, the uh, uh, RSVP she needs by June 16th to plan. Does anyone have other announcements they'd like to share? Let's take a moment or two and, and greet one another in, a, in our social distancing fashion, but uh, greet one another in the Lord uh, before we continue with our worship time. If we can begin finding our way back, I do have one. I'd like to have your attention. We have one more announcement I want to be sure to share with you. Next Sunday, next Sunday, the 21st, we will have a drive in worship service at 9 a.m. For those uh, who may not feel like coming to the regular service or prefer to do the 9 a.m. service for the drive through, or if you want to do both, we'd love to have you here for both. But 9 a.m. next Sunday will be our drive-in worship service. We'll do it as we have in the past. We'll do it in the uh, at the yard behind the church at the pavilion, and we'll have someone parking cars. But again, 9 a.m. for the drive-in service, 11 a.m. for our regular service. You can come to either one or both. Thank you. A singer chorus, isn't he wonderful? Isn't he wonderful? Or 
we thank you for the opportunity to be in your house again this morning. We would ask that you to bless everyone here. Bless those who have to give and bless those who do not. The Lord, just bless those who are missing, whatever the reasons may be, and leave them back to us. Lord, let us all be more faithful to you and go out and tell others about you. We ask this in Jesus' name. sing together, so I hope you don't mind, but uh, I, I kind of indulged myself and Donna and I both did by having them sing. But uh, 
anyhow, uh, we are getting ready for prayer, and uh, this is graduation season. A lot of kids have graduated. Unfortunately, uh, ceremonies and whatnot weren't quite what we had hoped, but um, uh, Kaylee Wenger uh, graduated, and uh, she had all kinds of cords around her neck, and uh, not the bad kind, but the good kind where they're draped, not, you know, around her neck. But uh, quite a nice picture, and uh, we've, we've had the joy of having your fellowship for over a year now. And it's been very nice to have the Wenger family with us. Kaylee, if you would come forward, we have a gift for you for your graduation we'd like to give you. This is from your church family for you. It's a MacArthur Study Bible. Great notes in there. Uh, if you ever get stuck reading that, you just look at the notes. They'll help you out a lot. It's a fantastic Bible. Congratulations on your graduation. We love you. Thank you. All right. Okay. Um, as we're preparing our hearts for prayer, um, I'm sure that there are some prayer requests that probably you brought with you today. Um, I have, let's see, prayer prayer of praise. Jenny's dad is home from the hospital. Jenny Dove's dad uh, says he's feeling much better. Uh, more tests are to follow in the coming weeks. So uh, we want to keep Jenny Dove's dad in our prayers. Uh, anyone else with a prayer request? today. Um, yes. Oh my. Okay. Darlene's granddaughter is at UVA with a brain tumor. Want to keep her in our prayers. Yeah. Rich. Okay, Je Jesse Props had a had a uh, stroke and is not recovering very well. Heat stroke. heat stroke, had a heat stroke. Okay, and uh, then Roger Miller found that radiation is not doing a whole lot for him, and he needs our continued prayers. Yeah, Esther. Okay, Angel Falls baby came home on Tuesday. That would be uh, Sandy Mongold's grandson uh, that came home. That's good. Anything else? Over here somewhere. Oh, Catherine Coleman? Comer. Okay, thank you. Catherine Comer's uh, passed away, so we want to remember her family. Yes, Courtney? Um, so this is a So I'm trying to, um, you know, I'm trying to freelance my work and I set up different like online shops and websites and you know, different things like that. Just pray that uh, God will bless that and your family for classes this month. Okay. All right. Courtney uh, had her job uh, was canceled because she was going to work at summer camps and uh, and uh, so she is trying to earn money with her art online. So she's asking for prayer, for guidance for that. Anything else? All right, well, let's look to the Lord in prayer. Our Father, we thank you, Lord, for your mercy. We thank you, Lord, for your goodness. We ask God that you would guide us. For Lord, surely these are times where men's hearts are being tried. We're not certain, Lord, what is going to come, but you know exactly what is going to come. And so, Lord, we throw ourselves onto your breast and we ask, Lord, that you would carry us through. 
We pray, Father, for these needs that were brought to us today. We pray, Father, for those that are struggling with health issues, those that have unspoken requests. We thank you, Lord, for answers to prayer, and we pray, Lord, for continual care on your part, Lord, that you might intervene in the lives of those that were mentioned this morning and those, Lord, that are on our prayer list as well. Father, we ask that you would guide us as we seek to make choices and decisions about how we are going to act and interact uh, in this current climate. And I pray, Father, that there would be a resolution. I pray, Father, that there would be a return to what, uh, what we knew and what we were doing. Help us, Lord, I pray, to learn lessons and to move forward. And we will give you praise. Now, Lord, we turn into your hands those that are in the medical field, those that are in the emergency services, and our patrolmen as well. And ask God your hand of safety upon them. Be with our missionaries as they carry out your work, uh, both home and abroad. In Jesus' name we ask. Amen. Um, today was going to be friend day, and so, uh, you know, normally I will tell you a, a sermon was planned months and months and months ago. No, this is one that the Lord has laid on my heart during this time, and uh, I feel very strongly that this is exactly what he wants us to know about himself today. We're going to look... Okay, there we go. We're going to look at uh, Isaiah 46, verses 9 through 11. I invite you to turn with me there. Isaiah 46, and then we're going to read verses 9 through 11. Remember this, keep it in mind, and take it to heart, you rebels. Remember the former things, those of long ago. I am God and there is no other. I am God and there is none like me. I make known the end from the beginning, from ancient times, what is still to come. I say my purpose will stand and I will do all that I please. From the east I summon a bird of prey, from the, a far off land a man to fulfill my purpose. What I have said, that will I bring about, and what I have planned, that will I do. We have a declaration from God. He is laying out, if you will, his cards on the table. And he is saying to those in his, in his uh, influence that he is not a God to be trifled with. He calls the angels, demons, mankind into account. And he says to them all, I am God, there is no other, there will never be another one. He says in another place in the scripture, no one created me. I have always been. He says to us clearly here in the scripture, two things. What he has said, he will bring about. What he has planned, he will do. Now, this is a statement of the glory of God. And this is spoken to agencies of people 
who believe that they can achieve a glory that will rise to the level of God himself. Now, the angels attempted it with Lucifer, and we read about it in Ezekiel 28. They said, I am going to raise myself up to the throne of God. I will raise myself up. And they sought out their own glory. They were cast from heaven to the earth. We know this from scripture. Mankind was tempted with the same thing. For the, the serpent said to Adam and Eve, God knows in the day you eat of it, you will be like him to be gods and know the difference between good and evil. And so to these agencies of people and of angels that believe themselves to be capable of self-determination and to be capable of their own glory, God calls them rebels and then lays out a case for who he is and the absolute unattainability of personal glory and honor. Now he does this because we are who he says we are. Rebels, the glory of God is found in different attributes of God, but today we are going to talk about the importance of God's omniscience. In Genesis chapter 11, Nimrod set about to build the Tower of Babel. I say Nimrod because Josephus points out that that is who it was. Um, Alexander Hislop, if you've ever read his great work, The Two Babylons, uh, he lays out a great historical case for the identity of Nimrod as being the builder of the Tower of Babel, the architect, if you will. And this tower was designed so that God might never be able to wipe out humankind, according to Josephus the historian. The idea was they would climb to the top of the, uh, of the tower and the floodwaters would not be able to reach them. They would raise themselves up to the highest heavens that they might even, as it were, touch God. And God confused their languages and separated them. We are now in the middle of a movement that wishes to rebuild Babel, that wishes to break down all differences between men, all languages to be abolished, all political boundaries to be abolished, all social boundaries to be abolished, even sexual boundaries to be abolished every boundary on the face of this world to be abolished so that man can once again be united and rebuild Babel. And you say, you say, Pastor, isn't that kind of outside of the scripture? Well, this is, this is a certainty as far as the revelation is concerned. Now, it will not be a tower, no. What I am saying is that they are trying to achieve a glory that is their own once again. The scripture says the Antichrist will lead them and they will say, who is like unto the beast? And who is it that can make war with him? And they will all follow him from the least to the greatest. Now, how can this pastor, this overweight, balding fellow, have such audacity to speak such things 
It is because I speak to you only what an omniscient God has already spoken. I do not speak to you my imagination. I do not speak to you my invention. Let us take a look at this first part of God's omniscience. According to the scripture, there are books in heaven that already have everything that will ever happen to men on clear down to the individual written in them. And they were written before the foundation of the world. This means before God said, let there be light in Genesis chapter one, he wrote down everything that would ever happen to you, to your country, to your family, to your nation, to your world, clear down to the sparrow that falls from the sky and the number of hairs on your head. He wrote it all down before he created anything. Now you say, well, why would he do that? It is for this reason, to make himself accountable. And you say, to whom is God accountable? To himself. He has no one greater than himself to be accountable to. And one day, according to the scripture, these books are going to be open. Books that were written before a single thing happened, and every one of them is going to be absolutely right, clear down to the finest detail. Absolutely right. Books that were written before you and I, Adam and Eve, the garden, anything was created. Let's take a look at what we see in the scripture, the book of Daniel, chapter 7. Now we're looking at uh, verses 9 through 18. As I looked, thrones were set in place, and the Ancient of Days, that's God, took his seat. His clothing was as white as snow, the hair of his head was white like wool, his throne was flaming with fire, and its wheels were all ablaze. A river of fire was flowing, coming from before him. Thousands upon thousands attended him. 10,000 times 10,000 stood before him. The court was seated and the books were opened. Then I continued to watch because of the boastful words that the horn was speaking. I kept looking until the beast was slain and its body destroyed and thrown into the blazing fire. The other beasts had been stripped of their authority, but were allowed to live for a period of time. In my vision at night, I looked, and there before me was one like the Son of Man coming from the clouds of heaven. He approached the Ancient of Days and was led into his presence. He was given authority, glory, and sovereign power. All nations and peoples and every language worshipped him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion that will not pass away, but his kingdom is one that shall never be destroyed. I, Daniel, was troubled in spirit, and the visions that passed through my mind disturbed me. I approached one of these standing before me and asked him the meaning of all of this. So he told me and gave me the interpretation of these things. The four great beasts are four kings that will rise from the earth, but the holy people of the Most High will receive the kingdom and will possess it forever. Yes, forever and ever. Now, we see here that the books were opened. And out of these books, God read what he had already written down before the foundation of the world. Now we also see in Revelation chapter 20,
The same thing in verse 12. And I saw the dead, great and small, standing before the throne, and books were opened. Another book was opened, which was the book of life. The dead were judged according to what they had done as recorded in the books. Make no mistake about it. Pastor Scott is not talking about heavenly books that he had a dream about or that he had a vision about or that he had some kind of mystical something about. He's talking about the books that are in the scriptures. These books are already written. They were written before the foundation of the earth. Every name, I need to click on this. Every name that would be saved before time or creation began was written in there. Back up to Revelation 17, verse 8. And it says here, the beast which you saw once was now is not yet will come up out of the abyss and go to its destruction the inhabitants of the earth whose names have not been written in the book of life from the foundation of the world will be astonished when they see the beast because he once was now is not and yet will come again those who are not written in the lamb's book of life from the foundation of the earth. That means before God created the first day of creation, he knew whether you would be saved or not. And he knows who will be saved yet. That's what it means. I know that that's really bothering you. I understand. It is a bother because we believe ourselves to be self-determined. And to a degree we are, but we'll talk about that shortly. Take a look at Psalm 139, verse 16. Psalm 139 and verse 16. And here we read, Your eyes saw my unformed body, all the days ordained for me were written in your book before one of them came to be. You see that there is still a reference to a book. But this is not the book of life. This is a book. And we know that later books in Revelation 20 are opened up. And the works of every human being are going to be exposed. Not works that you didn't know you were going to do and then you did and you said, oh my goodness, I ought to be. No, all the works God knew you were going to commit long before he even created the world that you and I live in. He knew what would happen. Your behavior, your life does not surprise God. It surprises you. But you didn't make God. God made you. So just because you're surprised about what's happening in this world and in your life does not mean God is. It's all happening exactly as he wrote it down. One other thing here, one other proof for us to look at. Matthew 10, 29 to 31. Are not two sparrows sold for a penny? Yet not one of them will fall to the ground outside of your father's care. Or in, in the uh, King James, it actually says that your father's will. Okay. And even the very hairs of your head are all numbered. So don't be afraid. You are worth more than many sparrows. The sovereignty of God is absolute. 
He absolutely knows everything that is going to happen. Where God said in Isaiah, what he has planned he will do, what he has said he will bring about, he means two things. One, what, he's, what he has said he will bring about. That is talking about what he wrote in those books. What he wrote in those books is going to happen down to the very last detail. Not a detail waste. Wasted. Every event clear down to the falling of a sparrow or the hairs on your heads was written in his books. Now you may find that to be awfully meticulous, but God is not a human being as you and I are. Nor does he find himself puzzled and dismayed by the events, because everything that is happening is happening exactly as he said it was going to happen. And one day when these books are opened, angels, demons, mankind are going to be shocked to find out that not a single thing that they did was unknown or surprising to our God. Now, there is one truth here that needs to be pointed out. This will probably help you a little bit where you're living. God's foreknowledge, however, does not negate our free will. This is important. First of all, we see in Deuteronomy chapter 28, verses 1, 2, and 15. God sets before the people blessings and curses. He says, if you will do this, I will bless you. And he, he says, I'll bless you when you come in and when you go out and when you, you know, he has a long line of blessings. And then he says, but if you disobey me, and he says, here's all the curses. Now in his audacity, the Lord doesn't just give them a choice, but he says, here's all these curses. And then he says, and this is what I'm going to do to you because you're going to do everything the wrong way. You're going to disobey me. And this is what's going to happen. He points this out in Deuteronomy 32. When God formed Israel, God knew Israel was going to sin. God knew Israel was going to abandon the truth. When God saved you, he knew the struggles you were going to have clear down to your thoughts Clear down to every sigh. Clear down to every roll of the eye. He knew, in fact, he wrote down every reaction you're having to this message right now. That is how sovereign God is over everything. However, he offers you blessings and curses. Why? You have the ability to make a choice. It's just God knows what choice you're going to make. You have the ability. God gives you the option. It's almost like God is saying to mankind, prove me wrong. If you obey me, I'll bless you. I promise I will. And this is how I'll bless you. And he lists all these things, but then he says, but you're going to disobey me, and this is how I'm going to curse you. And they could literally have proved him wrong if they had just simply turned and obeyed. They had the free will to do so. But God knew what they would do from the foundation of the earth. God didn't give them a choice and then wait and say, okay, now what are they going to do? And whatever they do, I'm going to change my course of action based upon what they do. Absolutely not. God already had a determined course of action because God already knew what they would do. God had already planned to deliver Israel from the, before the first day of creation as well. 
in De Deuteronomy 30, 19. He sets before them life and death, and he even tells them, choose life. He even tells them that. If they had no choice, or if their choices didn't matter, God would not have said, choose life. And yet God knew what choices they were going to make. His foreknowledge does not negate their free will, nor does it yours. The last is here. The right and power to think. In Acts 17, verses 24 to 30, let's read that together. Acts chapter 17, verses 24 to 30. We read this, the God who made the world and everything in it is the Lord and he of heaven and earth and does not live in temples built by human hands. And he is not served by human hands as if he needed anything. Rather, he himself gives everyone life and breath and everything else. From one man, he made all of the nations that they should inhabit the whole earth and be marked out. And, and he marked out their appointed times in history and the bounds, the boundaries of their lands. God did this so that they would seek him and perhaps reach for him and find him, <clears throat> though he is not far from any one of us. For in him we live and move and have our being. As some of your own poets have said, we are his offspring. Therefore, since we are God's offspring, we should not think that the divine being is like gold or silver or stone, an image made of human design and skill. In the past, God overlooked such ignorance. But now he commands all people everywhere to repent. For he has set a day when he will judge the world with justice by the man he has appointed. He has given proofs of, his, of this to everyone by raising him from the dead. And so here we see Paul arguing the very thing that I am talking to you about today. God's complete, utter absolute omniscience that it is so thorough that before one of us walked on the face of this earth he had all of our lives recorded in a book clear down to the hairs on your head clear down to your last breath he has it all written down now you say, well, okay, with this knowledge, what good is it? What should I do about it? I've already made the statement that's at the top, so we will leave it. Obey God for the sake of the angels for first. Obey God for the sake of the angels. What does it say in 1 Corinthians chapter 11? First Corinthians chapter 11. We're looking at verses 7 to 12. And so we read, A man ought not to cover his head, since he is the image and glory of God, but woman is the glory of man. For man did not come from the woman, but woman from man. Neither was man created for woman, but woman for man. It is for this reason that a woman ought to have authority over her own head because of the angels. Nevertheless, in the Lord, woman is not independent of man, nor is man independent of woman. For as woman came from man, so also man is born of woman, but everything comes from God. I, this particular 
reference is the only reference that we have <clears throat> and yet it is a universal truth the obedience of every man and woman on the face of this earth including the children the obedience is for the sake of the angels why because God wrote everything down in his books he wrote everything down his church is a church that was intended to be saved, to be presented without blemish, without spot, without wrinkle before the Lord. This is something that God said he was going to bring about, an unblemished, unspotted, unwrinkled church. And the angels, the ones that are faithful to God, are waiting to see the fulfillment of those words that were written before the creation of this world. The devils and the demons, on the other hand, are accusing God and saying that with, that, that with a, uh, a, a group of people for his church, such as us, that we will, like Adam and Eve, ultimately choose our own glory, our own comfort, our own way, our own opinions over God. And the argument is an accusation against a church that God said through Christ, I will build. The importance of obeying God is because he knows everything that is coming. He also knows whether you will obey him or whether you will trust him. And you may say, well, then what's the point? Why don't I just let the chips fall where they may? Well, God knew you were going to say that, didn't he? And he knew you weren't going to obey him and he knew you were going to rebel against him and he knew that you were going to join with those who want to prove him wrong. And to those who want to prove God wrong in his omniscience, I say, go for it. Spend your whole life trying to prove him wrong. Spend your whole life foolishly trying to outmaneuver God. You see whether or not you come out right in the end. Meanwhile, as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. Because the Lord is almighty. The Lord is enthroned in righteousness. The Lord is enthroned above all mankind. He knows our comings and our goings. He knows when we get up and when we lay down. He knows the hairs on our heads. He knows the breaths that we take. He knows every thought that we think. And he knew it from the foundation of the earth. I will not for one go up against such a God. I will bend my knee, bow myself, prostrate myself before such a God. And I will say, since you know all, Lord, let me simply do your will. And forgive me for all of my inventions and for my doubts and for thinking that you didn't know what was going on. Cling to God in faith as a rebuke to the demons. James 2, 17 through 19 says, show me your faith without works. You say you believe, fine, but even the demons believe and they tremble. Revelation 12, 10. Revelation 12, 10, I want to read directly. says this, then I heard a loud voice in heaven say, now have come the salvation and the power and the kingdom of our God and the authority of his Messiah. For the accuser of our brothers and sisters, our brethren in the King James, who accuses them before God day and night has been hurled down. Why? 
Would the devil and his angels accuse you and I of anything? We serve a sovereign God who is so certain of his omniscience that he has laid down the gauntlet to humanity and to Lucifer and his angels and has said, if you think you can do better than this, go for it. It is because you and I believe him to be sovereign. If you indeed do believe him to be sovereign. I dare say that most of the church does not. For most of the church is easily panicked. Easily scared. Easily caused to take a look at the world around us. Rioting, looting. The, the police and the authorities that we love and that we pray for and that we count on to care for us being threatened with defunding these kinds of horrors that are being thrust upon this world do you not know that God knew it was going to come about do you not know that he knew it was going to happen have you not been in prayer have you not been in the prayer closet? Have you not been communing with the Lord? Have you not been reading his scripture? All of this must come about. Because all of it will result in the world being proved wrong and God being proved right. And you may say that that seems like a petty thing. It is not a petty thing. God will be glorified. God is not mocked. And you can disagree with him. You can be mad about it. And you can be offended by this message today. But in the long run, I am telling you the truth. And you can stand up and you can grab my throat and try and wring the truth out of me. Until my body lies lifeless on the floor and it will still be true. Even if you silence this messenger, God will be glorified. Revival will come because it must. Because there is too much written in the scripture that must take place before the, the return of Christ. Too much revival must happen. And there must be a great turning towards God followed by a great falling away. Do not doubt the Lord. I am not making predictions. I'm reporting the scripture. Last of all, glorify God in your body. I was listening to an excellent sermon by John MacArthur the other day. He was asked, uh, he said that he's asked often, how's, how does the sovereignty of God and the moral responsibility of man, how do they intersect? And he said the simple answer is they don't. God is sovereign and we will never share in that sovereignty. And man is morally responsible to God and God will not take that moral responsibility from you. He has told you what would happen. He has told you what would come to be. He has told you, oh man, what is right. He has offered you blessings and curses, life and death. He has told you what must happen and you still doubt him. You still believe that he is such a doddering fool that he doesn't know what is to come. When you are troubled, don't just go to the Lord and just say, comfort me, comfort me, comfort me. Go to the Lord and enlist and say to him, I am a volunteer, Lord God. Do with me what you will. If it causes my death, so be it, but get glory out of my life. Get glory out of my family. Get glory out of my church. Yes, get glory out of my community. 
For this God is not a God who sleeps. He knows when the fullness of time is coming. He knew before the creation of this world, this revival that is on its way, he knows when the exactly right time is for him to inject that revival into humankind. All that I said, that will I bring about. The books and all their information. What I have planned, that will I do. Revivals at certain increments in history. God has plans according to his foreknowledge and he will intervene in the affairs of mankind. There will be a revival. Mankind is going to be more aware than ever of God and who he is and they are those that are destined for the fire will hate him the more for it. And those who are already written in the Lamb's Book of Life from the foundation of the world will turn and be saved. You and I don't know who they are, so keep preaching the word. You and I don't know the details, but God does. So keep praying and seeking his face. In 1 Corinthians 6, 19 and 20, and this is our concluding scripture. We read, flee from sexual immorality. All other sins a person commits are outside the body, but whoever sins sexually sins against their own body. Do you not know that your bodies are the temples of the Holy Spirit who is in you, whom you have received from God? You are not your own. You were bought at a price. Therefore, honor God with your bodies. I have laid before you today the sovereignty of God, his absolute omniscience. I have laid before you today the moral responsibility of man and your necessity to seek out the will of God to know his plan and to obey. I also will put a choice to you, and I know that God already knew before the foundation of this earth that I would lay out this choice. Choose today who you are going to fear, God or men, and fear them with all of your might Stop playing games. If it is God that you are going to fear, fear him and fear not the men. They can only take your life once. Fear God who can cast both soul and body into everlasting fire. Let's pray. God, this message, both encouraging and both so powerful, Lord, that we will be a lifetime digesting it. And yet, it was necessary according to your spirit. It is time for revival, Lord, and I pray in Jesus' name that you would send it quickly. For Lord, our, our world is certainly in danger. Amen. Hymn num number 352 in times like these, 352.
Father God, as obedient children, we seek to please our earthly mother and father. We seek to do as they ask. And many times they give us instruction, at times knowing that we'll fail to follow that instruction. They allow us to make our mistakes and they're there to lift us up if we'll turn to them. Father, sometimes we surprise them. Sometimes they expect us to fail and we don't. But Lord, you're never surprised. You've known since the very beginning the mistakes that we would make, the times that we would obey and the times that we would fail. But you continue to allow us to go and to make the mistakes in this life. May we seek to serve you, not to make those mistakes, but to hear your word, to seek your instru instruction, to come to you in prayer, seeking guidance in all that we do. And may we cling to that guidance. May we cling to you. And may we seek to serve you in all things, to do your will. We thank you that you forgive us when we fail. If we give Jesus our faith and trust. Bless us, Lord, as we go out. Bless us as we cling to that solid rock of Jesus. Bless us as we share your word with others. Thank you, Lord, for this time. Thank you for each one who heard your message today. May we be lifted up, may we be encouraged, may we be empowered by that message, not torn down. In Jesus' name we pray.
Praise God, the new Sunday. Oh.